Good afternoon everybody. For today's presentation I've elected to speak about interactions between the Norse speakers and the Irish speakers in the North Atlantic region. In the course of the presentation I'll attempt to use what I've learned from the directed reading so far and one or two other sources to try and answer two questions. Firstly, when we look at the settlement period, what was the contact between Celtic speakers and Norse speakers like? What forms did it take? And in relation to what evidence can we validate our theories? I'll be making reference to the saga literature and a selection of journal articles to support some of the information I'm presenting today. And I've illustrated some of my slides with what are basically my old holiday snaps. So apologies for that, but hopefully you'll enjoy looking at those at the very least. I'm going to tackle the first part of the question at the end because I think we really need to consider the evidence first and then think about how to interpret it. There is plenty of good evidence available to support the idea that the Celts and the Norse were in regular contact with one another. And an anecdote told by Magnus Magnusson supports this fact. He claimed that on one visit to Ireland, a taxi driver in Dublin demanded to know when the Icelanders were going to send all their women back. Anecdotes aside, this memorial stone at Akranus in Iceland commemorates the settlement of Iceland as recorded in the Landnamabók. This imposing piece of granite was presented by the Government of Ireland in 1974 to recognise the fact that the first two settlers in this particular area were in fact Irish, Thormodr and Ketel Bresason. You can see that the inscription is in Irish on one side and Norse on the other. One of the most obvious places to find linguistic traces of contact between the Norse and the Celts is in the enduring legacy of place names. The habit of naming places after land formations, the people who lived there, or the flora and fauna to be found there, was common to both cultures. <clears throat> and many Gallic place names in the Highlands, for example, have their basis in Norse names that have been subsumed into Gallic. Roddy Maclean of Scottish National Heritage has produced a very interesting booklet in which he outlines many examples of place names with Norse roots that have been repurposed into Gaelic, such as Croch Ramaskig near Laeg in Sutherland, which originates as Ramskiki or Raven Strip in Old Norse. Allness in Easter Ross is a place name that's also seen at Allness in Murro Rumstal on Norway's west coast. Another clear example would be the thing sites that are known to have existed in Iceland, Norway, Shetland, Orkney, Scotland and the Isle of Man, leaving behind the names Dingwall, Thingvetlir, Tinwald, Tingholm, etc. Evidence of Gallic place names in Iceland is harder to find, suggesting that the Celts settling there were not socially dominant. However, the name Tristansfjordr, meaning Tristan's Fjord, is cited by Svensson in his paper from 1959. Svensson also alludes to common Gallic words and personal names being embedded in Icelandic place names, citing Paulson from 1952. He gives Papa and Ira as examples of name elements suggesting Irish settlement. Within the British Isles there is a wealth of examples of personal names that show the extent of the assimilation of Norse culture. A short booklet written by Paul Moore in 2006 explores the Norse origins of many male and female personal names in Shetland. Moore presents lists of names for males and females indicating a Scandinavian origin. And it's interesting to note that the list of male names is strongly Norse, whereas the list of female names contains one or two examples such as Britta and Suniva, which may have Irish origins. And I'm curious about whether this may be evidence of trafficking of Irish women that occurred around about the time of the settlement in Iceland. Similarly, the saga literature and some of the academic journals we've been reading since the start of the module illuminate the use of Irish or Gallic personal names and shows how they became absorbed into the Norse culture. 
Names such as Cormac and Njal appear in the sagas. Craigie cites Lanama book, where a Hebridean man called Faxi is mentioned sailing with Floki Vilgetherson, after whom the river Faxi Os is named. Could this be an Icelander's attempt to render the pet name Fahi from Faha? Who knows? Finally here I want to mention Somaled, who has already put in an appearance on the module discussion boards. In 2005, the Scotsman newspaper printed a story expressing surprise that this Gallic hero was probably descended from Vikings himself, in which they cite the research of Brian Sykes of Oxford University. They should not be so surprised, since his name is a definite clue to his Norse origins. It's well known that the Vikings traded and raided either to the east, the Österled, from Sweden, or to the west, the Vesterled, from Norway or Denmark when they went a Viking. The name Somaled has similar origins, indicating that the person in question was a summer traveller. Hatherson, writing in 2010, devotes a whole paper to a selection of Roman coins found in Iceland in different locations and at different times. In the conclusion to his paper, the author cites Elian's theory that the coins were transported to Iceland by Irish monks, but remains unconvinced due to a lack of concrete evidence for the arrival of the monks and giving more credence to the theory that the coins arrived with the Vikings themselves. Perhaps this theory holds more merit than he gives it credit for, even though definitive proof has yet to be discovered. Many archaeological digs have revealed trade goods, such as jewellery, beads and pots, which provide evidence of interaction between peoples. Last week's highlighted examples of brooches and beads in particular that give us clues about how Celtic and Norse societies developed in parallel with obvious points of contact that led to borrowings of style and form between the two. Another feature to be mentioned last week are the so-called Norse mills in Shetland. The one pictured here is one of a series placed along the same burn. Whilst the name might suggest a Viking heritage, as Andrew pointed out, there is a question over whether these mills were in fact a Viking import or an older design already in use by the locals before the Norse arrived on the scene. Neither of these examples give any particular linguistic evidence, but still are evidence for interaction between the two cultures. Agna Helgeson's fascinating seminar three weeks ago left us in no doubt that there is good DNA evidence to support the theory that modern day Icelanders are in fact descended almost equally from the Norse and the Celts. His research tracing the lines of the mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome indicate that many Icelanders who participated in the study can trace their genetic heritage to both cultures down the maternal and paternal lines. Obviously this shows that there was what might be termed intermarrying, voluntary or not, to produce this admixture of DNA. Further genetic evidence of Norse DNA appears in the condition known intriguingly as Viking hand or Celtic hand. This condition, whose proper name is digitopalma contracture, is characterised by the bending inwards of the fingers, usually the little fingers or the ring fingers and appears predominantly amongst the peoples of Scandinavia and Northern Europe. It's widely considered to be a marker of Norse genetic heritage. It's particularly interesting that the common terms allude to both Celtic and Norse carriers. Finally, research carried out by Brian Sykes and Jane Nicholson of Oxford University reveal that the Celtic progenitor of the clan Donald, Sorley MacIlbride, also known as Somaled, was descended from Vikings himself and carried a Norse Y chromosome that has been passed down through the clan members to the present day. When peoples mix, it is inevitable that languages are affected. They borrow from each other, loanwords appear and so on. Svensson and Craigie both offer as evidence for language that has been assimilated from Gaelic into Norse. Svensson suggests that these could be potential borrowings by Scandinavians who had settled in the British Isles, 
and also Gallic imports travelling with the Celts to Iceland and sometimes to the other Nordic countries. Many Norse words have become so embedded into English that we no longer recognise them as loanwords. Pronouns, days of the week and many other common words come down to us from Old Norse. In Shetland, Orkney and Caithness, Norn was spoken, a language with a direct descendancy from Old Norse. However, Norn died out towards the end of the 19th century. It's interesting that many of the words are words that describe very ordinary, everyday activities of people. Words from domestic life, work life and religious life, not in keeping with the warlike image of the Vikings we may recall from our childhoods. Many of the Icelandic sagas either take place in the British Isles or include characters who are described as coming from different parts of the British Isles. The Book of Settlements, Landnama Saga, mentions Irish settlers by name. In the Vinland Sagas, two Scottish slaves, Harki and Hekja, are sent out to investigate the new land when Leif Erikson makes landfall on the North American continent. The author of the saga describes the garments the slaves are wearing, naming them as Biafal, perhaps comparable with the Irish words Kaval, meaning trunk of a shirt, or Gjóval, meaning garment. In Shelsensinger saga, a character named Bui, meaning dog, is mirrored by the Irish hero Cahulin, whose name also contains the word Ku, meaning dog. Another of the sagas, Orkneying saga, documents the history of the earls or jarls of Orkney at the time of Norse governance in the islands. The photograph on the left in this slide is of a replica Nor, the type of vessel used by the Vikings to carry people and goods, as opposed to the warships which were of a longer, sleeker construction. Knors were used by the Vikings settling Greenland and North America, and also feature in the Vinland sagas. This one was sitting awaiting maintenance in the ship museum in Orosund in western Norway. Characters in the sagas who are explicitly described as Irish, Scottish, Hebridean etc. are often only minor characters in the story and are sometimes described as thralls, slaves or concubines in the case of women. This may reflect the priorities of the authors seeking to play up the significance of Scandinavians and establish credi credibility for their lineage. Scandinavian men are the main players, as it were, so women and men of other nationalities are frequently only mentioned in passing, if at all. It's possible to discern some Gallic motifs in the sagas, for example the Gjalt. According to Almquist, this word describes a neurotic character who is given to panic and fleeing from danger at speed. This motif is widely accepted to have been borrowed from Irish writing. Another example might be the story of the childhood deeds of Cahulin and its parallels with the story about Colfer in Shalsnesinger saga. At the beginning of this presentation I explained that I would speak about how and where we might find linguistic evidence for interactions between the Norse and the Celtic peoples of the settlement era before trying to determine what this tells us about how these interactions could be described. I hope that in the preceding slides I've succeeded in doing that, albeit without going into too much depth given the breadth of the question and the time limitations. Linguistically we can find evidence for interaction through personal names and place names through loan words and borrowings in both directions and through common motifs and parallels in Irish myths and Icelandic sagas. Historical evidence gives us plenty of evidence that initial interaction was almost always warlike and violent. Raiding, settling land, taking slaves are not pastimes for the faint-hearted. However, the bulk of the evidence points to a more peaceful interaction, the telling of stories about families and the birth and naming of children, and about settling and naming features in the landscape, and gives us clues to the eventual peaceful coexistence of the Norse and the Celts in the North Atlantic region. <laughs>